So I'm Ken Kamoto. Um, I am a professor in biomedical informatics, also uh, associate chief medical information officer for the health system, uh, director of uh, what I'm going to talk about, this Reimagine HR initiative and co-director of our digital health initiative. Um, and I'm going to just describe for you today work we do uh, in our Reimagine EHR program to leverage uh, interoperability standards to incorporate AI into clinical care. Um, just as uh, some background and disclosure. So I'm fairly engaged in industry. So I have honorary consulting, sponsored research, writing assistance, licensing or code development. In the past years, two years with Tachi, Pfizer, NORC, RTI, Elsevier, UCSF, Indiana, Reagan Street, Cosme, MD Aware, UPenn, Yale, and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT via Security Risk Solutions. And some of the things I'm describing are or may be commercialized to enable wider impact. Um, all right, uh, so I'm gonna talk about things uh, with Reimagine HR in three uh, components. So first is around uh, sort of the unacceptable state of healthcare in terms of burnout and uh, lack of uh, um, uh, appropriate support. And I think we had uh, one more person joining. Let's do, hey, um, do you go by, uh, could we do introductions for, um, is it, do you go, uh, oh, for, oh, there's two folks who just joined. Could we do, um, I just started, could we just do introductions for uh, Maria? Maria? Maria Maria, and Cade. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind doing quick introductions. We just started. Sorry, I'm just trying to find a spot to sit. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm a postdoc in Alana Wellness Lab. And... I study the immune response to metastatic breast cancer. Cool. What about Kate? If you're talking, you're muted. Kate, do you want to introduce yourself? He said his microphone or his computer and is having issues and he ah, can't okay. use his microphone or camera. Uh, yes, I see the so, chat. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I was just saying, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, it's a small group and it's pretty cash. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, what we need to do to improve the, uh, the healthcare uh, sort of delivery experience, uh, reimagine HR program and just note about, you know, uh, as is the case with a lot of fields, it's it requires a lot of collaboration. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to tell you a little bit of myself because uh, it's always interesting to see where people come from. You know, we all come from a uh, different perspective. So uh, I grew up in mostly Southern California, and then I went to Harvard for my undergrad. I was a biochem major back then. So ironically, I never took computer science. So this was back in the 90s. So uh, I feel young, but I guess I'm probably older than a lot of folks here. Um, uh, there was computer science still back then, but um, I didn't take it because it was rumored that uh, it's hard to get an A in computer science and I was a pre-med and I need to keep my GPA up. <laughs> so um, uh, 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 during my, gosh, I was 18. I met my wife when I was uh, between my freshman and sophomore year. This is Caitlin uh, in North Carolina as I was um uh, doing summer research at uh, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, and um, and uh, sh she went to college in Boston as well. Uh, uh, and then um, I actually got into Harvard Med School, but um, uh, my wife um, she preferred to uh, her first choice was um, uh, grad school at UNC Chapel Hill, so uh, I went to Duke. And you know, back then I was like, ah, gosh, why can't why can't I go to Harvard? Right, it's a great school. But it turned out to be really life-changing because I went to the Duke uh, Medical Scientist Training Program. It's one of these MD-PhD programs where they pay your way through med school and grad school with the hopes that you'll end up uh, being a researcher afterwards. And that was really interesting because uh, it's one of the few programs where um, uh, you do um, your uh, first year of med school where they cram in two years of med school into one year. And then... Uh, typical schools, you'll do med school two years, do all the book work, and then you'll do your PhD, and then you do your clinical work. Uh, Duke's one of these uh, weird places where you actually do the typical third year of med school where you're seeing patients all the time in your second year before you do your PhD. And what that basically means is you get uh, uh, um, uh, placed into uh, 
the clinical work before you do your PhD and you're immersed in it. So I was an immunology researcher back when I was an undergrad and, and such, and I used to do all sorts of basic science things. And to date myself, one summer, I spent a whole summer doing Sanger sequencing of like, I don't know, a few thousand base pairs, right? And I lost my sense of smell that summer because I think I, I got too much exposure to some uh, uh, radioactivity while doing Sanger sequencing. But anyway, so that's the kind of work I was planning to do um, when I was, uh, and I was doing transplant immunology work back in, as an undergrad. But I went to Duke and then for the folks who are in medicine, you know what this is about, right? Like I, I was like, I can't believe how crazy bad, you know, information systems are in health healthcare, right? It's it just insane. Like, you know, it's still the case to, to a lot, large extent today, but back then it was, you know, just as bad or worse where you're like, okay, like the patient was just seen across the street at the VA, but I have to go in with a floppy disk, right, <laughs> to get the medical record because we have no idea what what they were doing there last week. Um, uh, hey, Roger. Um, uh, so, uh, so anyway, so it was uh, pretty life changing. I decided to uh, do a uh, so MD PhD was really kind of cool, and Roger is one of the co directors of the Digital Health Initiative. And I'd say it's optional, Roger, for, for you to be on. Uh, please feel free if you have other things, but I'm just describing your reimagining HR work. Oh, sounds great. I'm, I might just stay for the education. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so uh, that was interesting where I, I decided, you know, I really want to get into this field. Uh, the MD-PhD program was nice because they, you know, guaranteed admission to any PhD program you wanted after you got in and they'd pay your way the first few years. Um, but uh, I decided, you know what, I want to do medical informatics. Like, like, and then it turns out Duke was one of the few places that had um, a medical informatics training program. Um, it was interesting because uh, my MD PhD director, the chair of pathology, said, "This is career suicide. Why are you going into like IT? Like, there's no no future in IT. Like, that's just like you know, basically like IT tech guys, right? Like, don't throw away your promising career doing something like that." Um, <laughs> but anyway, so with all that said, I, I decided this is what I, this was where the pain point is. This is where I want to start. And I started by taking computer science with undergrads. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting with all these, um, like, you know, taking classes with these 18 year olds and stuff. Um, but I really loved it and, uh, uh got into that field at that time. Uh, it so happened to be, um, Ed Hammond, uh, was one of the key folks there, um, uh, he's uh, one of the inventors of the electronic health record and uh, uh, founded the area of standards based interoperability in HL7. Um, he's still active actually at Duke, um, uh, but um, uh, he introduced me to trying to uh, come up with approaches that can scale across institutions and uh, whatnot with healthcare interoperability. So I got engaged in, in that work. Um, uh, and then uh, a little bit later on, uh, so I had an interesting thing where while I was still in med school right after PhD, I got appointed to the faculty. So I was an assistant professor, uh, worked a little bit, and then uh, I had to go back to finish med school. <laughs> uh, so I uh, finished med school and then uh, was on the faculty a little bit, uh, got a, a career development award from the National Human Genome Research Institute. And as a part of that, my external advisor was Joyce Mitchell, who was the department chair of uh, biomedical informatics here. She, she's retired now, but she was a big genetics uh, informatics person. Um, so after I was there, I finished my K, um, uh, uh, there was, um, uh, I was potentially looking for different places to go and I got recruited to um, to Utah. So that was 12 years ago. Um, and uh, really fortuitous, like, you know, I think like many of you, I was like, oh, like I didn't, like Utah was just somewhere between the East and West Coast, right? Like if you didn't grow up here, like that's how people who live in the coast view almost everything in the middle of the country. So. Um, so I never would have thought I would end up in Utah, but it was perfect because it's. Um, <clears throat> I came here as a dual operational research role. Um, I'm really interested in practical applications, and I got specifically recruited uh, to have that kind of uh, dual role in across both research and operations. And uh, I've been here now for 12 years, so it's it's um, it's been a great place. I think Utah's pretty unique because uh, compared to other places, I don't know how many institutions folks have been at, but it's kind of, uh, it's much more collaborative than most places. Um, people are nicer, I'd say. People here, like the, 
I'd say the surgeons here or like the pediatricians at other institutions. I don't know if, how many folks who've been in healthcare can attest to what the culture is like, but like, I don't know, like it was, I, I really like it here. The, uh, the kinds of things we've been able to do, I don't think would have been possible in a lot of other institutions because people are so open to trying new things here. Uh, so that's where I've been. Okay, so that's just a little bit of background for myself and sort of where I come from. I really got into this field because as I got into the trenches, I was like, I can't believe how crazy bad things are in healthcare in terms of information management, information systems. And uh, I quickly got drawn to the fact that this is where I wanted to make things better. So, you know, looking at a lot of this, uh, folks are in like pop health and stuff are probably pretty uh, aware of this, but um, uh, there's the classic report from the Institute of Medicine to Earth Human, now the National Academy of Medicine, that uh, found that, you know, in very conservative estimates, we're probably killing about 100,000 patients every year in our inpatient settings due to medical errors. That's a pretty big deal, right? That's like a jumbo jet crashing every day. So uh, estimates vary, but uh, it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, one of the least safe places you can be in healthcare is like a hospital, right? Because... Um, uh, lots of things are happening. You, you could you could die. Uh, quality of healthcare delivering the uh, to adults in the U.S. Classic paper from McGlynn and colleagues in National England uh, New England Journal of Medicine that found that patients receive only about half of recommended care. It, anytime you look systematically at how how we deliver healthcare in the U.S. and you look at things that we know for a fact should be delivered, it's usually about half. And there's Fair number of studies showing that once we know for a fact that this is absolutely the right way you should care for patients, it usually takes about 15, 20 years before that becomes something that you can typically expect that you'll you'll get, you'll receive as a patient. And these care quality issues persist. Uh, so uh, as you look, um, you know, it, it's, it's still there, right? Like every time you look, uh, we are still hovering oftentimes in the, we, as a patient, you're receiving care about half the time that's the right care. So this is where I'm really attracted to this field, which is, you know, there's a lot of discoveries to be done for sure. Uh, and that's super important. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of need for the fact that when we know for a fact, this is how we should care for patients. It typically happens about half the time uh, for about a few decades. Um, so in this context, EHRs uh, uh, were thought to be potential, potentially helpful, right? Technology we think should help with uh, things, but uh, this is a uh, uh, article in Fortune and Ki by Kaiser Health uh, News and Fortune that says, you know, <laughs> death by a thousand clicks where EHRs went wrong. So we spent billions, tens of billions uh, to, to do this, but you know, the system is an unholy mess. Right. Uh, if if you're a provider, you know this electronic health records are a top cause of physician burnout and stress, right? Like <laughs> you're a doctor and a, it's usually in the top three causes, sometimes the top one of like what makes you frustrated and make you want to quit medicine. Physicians spend two to an average of two to five hours on the EHR for every hour with patients. And say, for example, an emergency department physician goes through an average of about 4,000 clicks per shift to just get through the day. So you can kind of see how technology we oftentimes hope will help us, but is oftentimes not all that great. Here's a, another New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, looking at protocol-based computer reminders for the quality of care and the non-perfectibility of man uh, by Dr. Clem McDonald. Um, so he conducted a randomized controlled trial of 390 clinical protocols integrated with the electronic health record. Like, you know, if this is true about the patient, you need to make sure you test for this, et cetera. Physicians agreed uh, about 80% uh, of the time with what uh, he created in the computer. And he showed an over doubling of the increase in protocol compliant care uh, in a randomized control trial. So let me ask you, uh, when do you think, what year do you think uh, uh, Clem published this paper? I'll take guesses. Two thousand and five. Two thousand and five. Any other guesses? One. 2001? No, 2020. 20. Any other guesses? I'm going to guess. Oh, I'm going to say 1995, because when I worked mm -hmm. in the hospital as a new nurse. Yeah. Anyway, go time. ahead. Yeah. It was 1976. <laughs> so this was before I was born, right? So you kind of think about this, and he's still active. He's one of my mentors, right? 
it is just crazy to me that we have known how to do this for what is it almost 50 years is it more yeah almost 50 years right and look at the state we're in now right can you say that you know you would agree with 80 percent of the things that the ehr suggests you do <laughs> do we have hundreds of clinical protocols running in our systems to support us to make sure we're compliant with care and doubles how we do? So this is, I think, right, like a huge challenge, right? We we have known how the technology can help, but the way our industry has uh, happened, it, it really isn't. So looking at some papers uh, of looking at uh, the situation, almost 50 years later, uh, let's say ordering Tylenol, right? Um, and I think these were done in uh, representative Epic and Cerner systems. These are systems that, uh, uh, for those who aren't familiar, are probably the most expensive and most widely used in places like academic medical centers. How many clicks do you think it took as best case to place the order for Tylenol? And what do you think was eight. the worst case? I'm going to say best case, eight, worst case, 20. 14 and 62, right? And this is just looking at like places like us, right? To see like just measuring like how 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 does it, and you can understand, right? Like, huh, why would an electronic system be the reason why people are burnt out? It's because it takes you freaking 62 clicks to place a Tylenol order. Or here's a prednisone uh, steroid taper, right? Typical taper you would do. Um, what was the average rate at which there was an error in how the order was placed in these uh, you know, places that buy systems that can cost billions of dollars to implement and support? Thirty percent. Yep, 37%. Right? Simple taper. <laughs> Wrong a third of the time. So and I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did they and, and maybe mm -hmm. I, I'm just yeah. thinking, how do they know that it's an error rate? Does the provider mm -hmm. say, oh, that was not meant to be that way? Because yeah, these are... I am a clinician as well. Yeah. And so I know that there are several different providers, and even mm -hmm. if there's a recommended way to do it by the computer, many providers will change that intentionally. Yeah, so I would look at the source paper uh, listed there, but um, this is done by our colleague, I think out of MedStar, who's a really good uh, patient safety okay. usability expert. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we can look into the, the details. And I guess, um, you know, methodology wise, it's always tricky of how you measure things and, you know, is it practically impactful, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, his work is pretty solid. I don't remember okay. the details, but, um, but I don't think it's, it's a tr trivial error. Right. Uh, the main thing I would note is that humans are pretty resilient. You can do a lot to us without killing us. So I think part of the reason why like this doesn't surface so much is you can generally do a ton of bad things to people and they won't die. Right. I mean, so, but, but it sometimes does. And that's why, that's why like, you know, we're killing like a hundred thousand patients a year through mistakes. Um, here's another one. I see you high dose alerts. Uh, so remember where uh, Clem said uh, his work, people agreed with it 80% of the time. How often do you think people accepted it when uh, the system said, Hey, this is too high of a dose. And in what percent of the time when they said, no, no, computer, you're wrong, or was it appropriate for them to override the computer? If you're in practice, this would probably be, I'll just show you. 7% <laughs> of the time, providers said, yep, I agree with you, computer, for what you're telling me I should do. And 90% of the time that they uh, overrided it, uh, the provider was right and the computer was wrong. So this is kind of the state of uh, medicine, right? And the health IT system. So uh, in our program that uh, we started here um, called Reimagining HR, we're really trying to figure out how can we do this better? So in terms of improving the HR, uh, I'd say category-wise, there's two approaches. One is traditional EHR optimization. So this is where you like take the vendor product because at this point, most of the EHRs around the country are completely vendor-based. You configure it, you train folks, you personalize it. Uh, capabilities are really depend on the individual EHR platform. So this is particularly an issue when you go with systems that don't cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to implement. Uh, and oftentimes you ask and hope. So an example for this, even in like Epic, right, where they, you know, make 
tons of money, right? Uh, their installations can cost billions of dollars. Um, and, um, you know, uh, if you go to their campus, they have literally like, you know, conference rooms with life-size dragons, they have so much money, right? Uh, it's an ask and hope. So like there are areas in Epic, for example, and where you're configuring it, where when you try to search for something and let's say you know you have a pneumonia protocol, if you type in pneumonia and it includes pneumonia name, it, it doesn't return it to you. It's a start spy search, right? Where it you have to remember that this protocol starts with the name base ambulatory slash inpatient protocol for pneumonia, right? Like you have to start, it's, you, right? Like, it's like we, everyone's pointed out and they still don't have it. So you're kind of left at the whims of what they do. So what's really interesting here is that the federal government and the standards bodies, and I'm heavily involved in, uh, in sort of both realms, have uh, required it now that you can uh, you have to open up these EHRs and be able to add on top of them and put additional capabilities that you can interface uh, in, kind of like how you can download uh, apps onto your smartphone. So this is now federally mandated. Um, and in terms of AI integration into the EHR, right, this is uh, uh, vital for uh, making use of a lot of these capabilities coming in and certainly for even non-AI stuff. Uh, but EHRs have limited support. Uh, I won't go into the details, but um, uh, suffice it to say, it depends on the EHR capabilities. And this is also a source of a digital divide because the most expensive systems have tend to have the best support for it. Uh, so, a so a promising approach to integrating is to use standards like this to, um, uh, to integrate. Uh, this is what <laughs> visually what you can think of. You have providers, you have patients using different applications. And historically, you've had to, in order to do this kind of integration of third-party systems, it was pretty uh, uh, system-specific. Now there are standards that are uh, uh, required, developed by standards bodies like the ones I'm engaged in and now federally mandated so that you can connect uh, using a common way across these platforms. So what I'm going to um, uh, do, this is pretty technical. I'm going to skip past these. Um, uh, I'm going to just describe our program a little bit um, and then um, uh, just show you some examples. And then I, I, I'll probably just take it right to discussion. So we started this uh, Reimagine HR System uh, initiative back in 2016. Um, I'm the founding director. Uh, and the goal is to improve patient care and the provider experience through interoperable EHR apps that convert data to actionable insight. Uh, we've implemented a number of solutions into our system. There's a paper on this uh, in Jamie Open. Uh, we're now actually up to over $55 million in grants. Uh, uh, and we just heard about another one, so maybe we'll be up to $60 million uh, for fairly shortly. So it's been a highly fundable area. So as you think about, um, you know, especially if you're working in applied areas, uh, this kind of area is um, uh, very promising. Interoperability is very um, very much uh, seen as a uh, key area that NIH focus on, focus on and is uh, identified as um, uh, an area of focus. Um, and uh, this is a, one of the pillars of our digital health initiative, along with uh, Roger's um, uh, Gap Lab initiative. Um, uh, so, oh, and I saw Vicky join. Hey, Vicky, um, I think uh, uh, Roger joined as well, but uh, I think just me is fine for this talk. So you're welcome to stay, but if you have other things, please feel free to drop. Um, so when should you consider an app uh, when native EHR capabilities are insufficient, uh, when you desire wide dissemination, but it's too costly to re-implement at each site and obviously where you get really good value for the cost. Um, I'm gonna just skip past this. Um, I'm just gonna very briefly uh, and quickly go through some examples just to get a sense of, get you a sense of what uh, kind of uh, 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 examples are. So here, if, if you're uh, familiar with the babies, um, uh, uh, babies oftentimes uh, have uh, elevations in bilirubin called hyperbilirubinemia. It's a toxic byproduct um, uh, uh, that uh, can cause, I mean, the main issue is it can cause brain damage, right, if you don't control this. So uh, there's guidelines for this, uh, and we implemented, some, but it's actually a, a fairly complex guideline. So we uh, implemented an app that I'll show you that uh, showed that we significantly improved the odds of clinically appropriate phototherapy, uh, reduced the clinician time required for management about threefold, and uh, 
uh, our providers uh, rated it as having best imaginable usability in standardized scales. Uh, and there's a JAMA open paper describing it, but just to show you what something like this looks like. So for folks who use Epic, um, this probably looks familiar, but the blurred parts is the EHR. And what we can do is we can insert into the workflow exogenously developed applications that interface with the data, right? And visualize and provide guidance on it. So just to give you a sense of this, this is looking at um, uh, the patient's, uh, this graph, the x-axis is how many hours it's been since the baby was born. The y-axis is the patient's bilirubin level. Uh, the blue line shows the patient's level of bilirubin where basically if, if it gets high, it's dangerous. Um, you have these uh, uh, purple T's with the error margin. Those are noting uh, transcutaneous ones where you measure it on the skin, which has an error margin, which is accounted for in the guidelines and recommendations. Uh, we show things like um, the patient's uh, uh, thresholds for uh, doing different actions, which are shown in green for the phototherapy and red for exchange transfusion with uh, the, uh, the bolded one reflecting the patient's specific um, uh, risk factors. You have things like the yellow bars uh, visualizing when the patient was administered phototherapy in the, in the, um, in the nursery. And on the right, we have all sorts of data that's been pre-pulled for the patient, uh, including uh, going into the patient's mother's record using uh, standards and pulling in their data uh, with the recommendation provided in green. And uh, here's some uh, AI uh, prediction role information provided in green um, based on the data that we have. Um, this just shows the latest version that we've now incorporated, uh, implementing it at the University of Utah, uh, which um, uh, takes advantage of something known as end tidal carbon monoxide to see the degree of uh, hemolysis that's happening in patients. But all this is to say, right, like these kinds of tools allow you to uh, take approaches that the EHR doesn't uh, necessarily support to provide guidance and integrate AI. Uh, I'm going to skip past this. Um, here's another example, and I'm going to go really fast at this point. Uh, this is collaborative work with Hitachi, where we built uh, AI-driven prediction models for uh, what's likely to work for a given patient for diabetes management, because after metformin for diabetes, it's uh, the guidelines, uh, it's pretty much uh, leave it to a, a, a trial and error approach. Uh, and we have um, uh, here basically information provided on uh, what's the likely uh, uh, benefits of treatment and a uh, number of papers around the machine learning and AI aspects of this. Here's another example uh, from uh, this uh, inner system from uh, around opioids. So the goal here is to provide point of care support for CDC guidelines for uh, prescribing opioids, because as you know, opioids is a, a big issue. It's sponsored by the CDC and the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. Lots of collaborators, and I'm engaged in this uh, work where we can uh, integrate um, uh, much more um, uh, robust uh, distance board in the system than the typical EHR can uh, provide, including things like uh, natural language processing of uh, free texted uh, prescription six, which is pretty common. Um, and uh, uh, you can see here, and I'm still pretty actively engaged with the CDC and ONC on this work. Um, we've done other work with uh, uh, trying to reduce alert fatigue uh, by looking at machine learning mod me methods to see if you can predict when a provider, nurse, et cetera, is going to ignore uh, what you alert them on. Uh, and we found through this that uh, we could potentially use these uh, approaches and standards-based approaches called CDS hooks to uh, perhaps filter out over half of medication alerts while missing less than 1% of alerts that would have been acted upon. Uh, here's another uh, example. This is for prediction model-driven lung cancer screening, uh, shared decision-making. This took an app uh, for lung cancer screening shared decision-making that Angie Fagerlin from Pop Health Sciences and Tanner Caver Caverly from Michigan uh, initially developed for the VA. Uh, uh, that was a web-based tool called screenlc.com. Uh, and this is needed for lung cancer screening because you, the patient-specific uh, benefits from screening vary quite widely depending on your personal risk factors. Um, and this is important for lung cancer because uh, it, a lot of times people don't know this, but lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. and the leading, uh, by far the most uh, preventable lung cancer death compared to things like breast and colorectal cancer. It can save many more lives than things like breast cancer screening, but screen rates are really low, uh, typically under 10% in the nation. Uh, partly because you have to uh, uh, do things like uh, shared decision-making using a decision aid. We integrated this within the EHR, uh, driven by a 23 variable inside predictive model. Uh, we have a chess paper that... Uh,
Hey folks. Hey, can you hear me? I can now. Yeah, you cut out for just a minute. Yeah, it looks like my uh, home computer died, so I will <laughs> I will continue after I restart my machine. Um, uh, why don't we take this up right now? Uh, I, I still have a few more examples, but why don't we just cut cut out to um, uh, your thoughts, especially if uh, folks are kind of engaged in the translational area or whatnot, um, questions or thoughts around these areas? I have a question. Um, I haven't used Epic a ton, um, but everything that I think that we've seen is like from the provider can see. And I was wondering what can the patient see? And if any of these apps are like helpful for them to log into their MyChart and see, oh, I'm in the right range or if there's any um, like feedback for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have uh, work in that area as well. And I'll actually in lung cancer screening. So um, so yes, um, Roger actually works a lot more in this area than I do, but um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll see. Roger, are you on? Can do you, you, can, do you want me to answer some questions while you work on your computer stuff? Yeah, do you want to talk about some of your patient facing stuff that you work on? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to. So, um, so I run the therapeutic games and apps lab um, and uh, and we're starting this new software development core as well to sort of streamline getting more people uh, to be able to do this kind of a work. And we're seeing a lot more interest in patient facing um, uh, applications, uh, games, virtual reality experiences, all sorts of stuff. So for example, that can uh, range greatly from, I'll give you an example of a, uh, a, a tool that's being used by um, one of our partners in nursing, Lori Linder, is has a big trial going on right now for a piece of software called Color Me Healthy. And Color Me Healthy is a tool designed to help uh, pediatric chil uh, children and who are seeing pediatric oncology treatment um, describe their symptoms and manage symptoms with their clinicians. Uh, the problem that's trying to be solved there is that um, uh, frequently the amount of time necessary is short for all of us um, on the clinical side and on the patient side. And with children, it takes longer to get symptom description for um, language issues or cognitive issues or uh, just being shy for goodness sakes, right? And so it's it's sometimes quite difficult. So Color Me Healthy is a, a gamified app then that allows them to both journal while they're playing it, uh, to draw what they think their symptoms look like, to create an avatar that looks like them and do virtual body stuff. And then it actually translates that into a form to give to clinicians. So the clinician has some tools when they come in to speak with the patient about what's going on there. Um, in that same kind of a vein, we have a, a, a what's called the going home toolkit. Uh, discharge is a very complicated time, a very complicated process. And so what they, uh, it, you know, and we help people in the hospital with discharge by talking them through things. But this is an application that allows them to sort of create a map of who's going to pick me up? Where am I going to get my food resources? How am I going to make my prescriptions filled? Who do I call for the things that I need to call, right? It's actually integrated with the uh, United Ways 211 database as well. So if they don't have particular resources, they can get those resources. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we're doing things like virtual reality, where we're saying, hey, listen, how do we get physical therapy to both underserved people and folks in rural or even frontier kind of places? And we think one of the answers to that is virtual reality physical therapy. So we're working with um, ortho and with PMNR and with PTs to create this system that can be used both either uh, at home or we can just ship it to you if you're really, you know, out there or you can't afford or whatever the things are. There's so many barriers to getting somebody in clinic sometimes, money, distance, transportation, all those things. And so these are ways of doing it. Um, and so there's a just a bevy uh, and a, a huge appetite for these sort of digital experiences that help patients either receive treatment through it or augment the care that they're already receiving to be more effective. Um, and like on that latter one, for example, we have this great depression, uh, this game for geriatric depression treatment where um, a lot of people are treatment resistant medication doesn't work as well as it should. We give them this game 
that uh, does neurocognitive remediation and uh, stretches their you know executive control function a bit. And if we do that, it primes them and their medications actually start to work better. They start to respond better to treatment, right? So adjuvant therapies, therapies, and then also some of the things that are involved with sort of clinical workflow, not clinical workflow, but, you know, patient engagement with the healthcare systems, trying to smooth out some of those bumps to make it easier for patients to engage. This is a huge field that is just rapidly growing. And in the past, the desire to make this kind of software has always been around. But what's special about what's happening now is the work that Ken's been talking about. This idea of interoperability, EMR integration, patients being able to access their data and also give their data because patients are generating all sorts of data with wearables and phones and all these other kinds of things anyways. So we're finally getting to the point where we're, we're working on completing this circle that we can make software for patients that will actually um, be part of their care team's use as opposed to them downloading their own app and trying it out and telling their clinician what the results were. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Roger. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. That's all super cool. Super excited. Awesome. It I'm is a just... good time to be in this stuff. I got to tell you, it's, it's a fun time. Yeah, no, it's... um. Part of what I learned is, uh, right, because health IT is so hot when I was told like, hey, you're just throwing away your career. Why why the heck are you going into this loser field? I, I've, I heard that also with population health management, where it's like, oh, like, why are you doing that? Why are you helping Medicaid patients? And all of a sudden, equity is hot, right? Like, it's anyway, it, it's it's very interesting. Like, you just got to pursue what you think is important and interesting, right? Because if you just keep pursuing what somebody tells you you should pursue because it's it's where the future is, like <laughs> it, you could be sorely disappointed. Um, all right, I'm just gonna wrap this up. So uh, uh, this has been very helpful. We're disseminating this quite widely, including uh, throughout the Veterans Administration. And uh, we are working on a patient-facing app version of this to uh, cover the fact that uh, we still need to directly engage patients to. Uh, uh, to meet where, them where they're at. It's just a chest paper showing these results. Let me just, uh, this is just showing that we can do population-based testing. This is uh, NCI funded work uh, showing that uh, we can use uh, uh, chatbot technology to engage with patients and to, uh, this is for familiar hyper, uh, uh, hereditary cancer uh, risk identification. About 10% of us are at risk of um, early onset breast colorectal cancer, et cetera. Uh, we've uh, uh, been working on showing that, you know, you can, uh, uh, used things like chatbots to get people tested, et cetera, uh, uh, with limited genetic uh, counseling resources. Here's uh, MDCalc for EHR. If you're a clinician, you've probably used or heard of something called MDCalc, pretty widely used tool. Uh, by some measures, the most widely used clinical tool uh, in the U.S., about two-thirds of U.S. physicians. Uh, we partnered with them to make their uh, clinical calculation tool for hundreds of system uh, of calculators, clinical calculators, integrated with the EHR and uh, auto-populated. Um, Chronic disease, uh, obviously pretty important. Lots of things you have to go through. Um, I'm just gonna go right to example. So this is a, uh, another platform. Uh, this can uh, auto identify what conditions you have and then identify guideline-based uh, key care needs, provide pull relevant data from across the EHR, uh, provide a recommendation, uh, allow you to order them and uh, also auto generate documentation and uh, launch into other EHR modules and other apps. Um, and we've certainly seen uh, that we can also incorporate uh, predictive analytics, like for machine learning based predictions for uh, diabetes pharmacotherapy uh, and um, uh, launch other apps and do things like review predicted uh, outcomes. Uh, uh, this is just showing that uh, this kind of system can uh, help improve care. Uh, I'm going to skip past these key challenges because they're very technical. Um, just, so just a summary, standards-based uh, apps are really a powerful approach to integrating AI support to clinical disease support and EHRs and clinical workflows, and uh, we're uh, pretty actively engaged in this work, uh, and more research is needed. Um, and, you know, I think this is what I kind of come back to. This is where I always feel like I feel young, but I guess I'm old, right? And then I, I think you know, we've been talking about this stuff forever. Like Clem, right, literally wrote a landmark paper showing that this is how we should care for people like in the 1970s, right? And 
every single time I get together with folks saying, Hey, what's the next, where are we going? Like, it's like, Oh, in the next 10 years, like we're actually going to take better care of our patients through health IT. And it's like, you know, we're still sort of working on it. So I, I think we just need to like, from a patient perspective, it is just insane that like, you basically have to have a medical degree to make sure that you receive the right care. Right. Like that, that is just insane. Like you shouldn't have to be a physician or a nurse to make sure that you're, you and your family are getting the right care all the time. Um, and let's work together. Uh, just a partial list of acknowledgements. Obviously, lots of different people engaged in this kind of work. Uh, some of the key folks uh, working on this. And uh, uh, disclaimer, and that's it. So I'm going to stop it here. And then I uh, would love to have any discussion on um, this kind of topic or just you know general career kind of things um, in the few minutes we have. Uh, or end early, which is good with me too. <laughs> I have more questions. Um, so I'm yeah. in clinical research, and so I'm hearing, seeing all this, and I'm wondering um, how it can apply to like a a research, a clinical research setting where you have like a participant, like a behavior change intervention or anything, and the mm -hmm. machine learning and all of that seems so ideal. And I was wondering if you guys work in that sphere at all. Yeah, so I think Roger works quite a bit in it. And yeah, like this is all simply saying, can technology help? And usually the answer is yes. <laughs> so, you know, we use it for clinical trials recruitment. We use it for clinical trial protocol. We use it for coaching intervention for weight loss. Like um, bottom line, if you can think it, it probably is possible. Um, I don't know, Roger, if you want to add to that. No, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that we get a lot of folks who are doing clinical decision aids, or inquiry tools, like all sorts of different things that are ways of engaging with patients and, and interesting ways to get data from them and or to experiment with like behavior change and, and all of that, right? And everything in between. And some of it is pretty, uh, like like one project I think is an example is we had an experiment on um, relaying health data back to patients through virtual reality using metaphor rather than charts. So rather than seeing your A1C on a piece of paper, you would see it as a mountain range and you would compare that to someone else's and testing impact and things like that. So I think the world's your oyster on this kind of stuff, right? And I think that and the timing is really good because more and more um, medical centers are spinning up resources to empower folks to be able to do this. Like, because that's one of the things is you have to find the right partner for this. And I guess in the past, a lot of people went to industry for this kind of work. And that can be a good relationship. You can have a good relationship with industry building an app or an intervention or whatever for you. But that requires a specific set of skills to be a good client, uh, Client, make sure your IP is protected, all of those kinds of things. So when you have an internal partner to the university or to the uh, medical center that you're at, it's a lot safer. So when you go to a system that has a, an innovation lab, for example, and you say, hey, we want to spin up something doing this kind of a thing, um, you know, it's really well aligned. They're going to understand your system well, the needs of technology, and they're going to be on your side, which is really important. That's awesome. Thanks. I have a question that's like, seems pretty tangential to all of this, but as someone who is not in clinical care necessarily, like I'm a bench researcher, this was one, terrifying, and two, like, especially during the COVID age, we heard a lot about nursing shortages and staff turnover and stuff like that. So how does like the human element of like retaining people, the staff, like how long a doctor or nurse can spend with each patient, like correlate or kind of go along with these technological advances? Sorry. Can I give a short example, sense. Ken? I've, I've got yeah. something for that maybe is less scary. Um, so yeah, yeah, look, getting all this technology in everyone's life, I think as Ken described, has not made everything easier or made things uh, simpler, right? The, the number of clicks, the MR integration, that's why we're also passionate about making this work. Um, but I think that one of the things that's interesting is the ability to offload routine labor and or um, push things to patients so that when they get to see you, um, that you already have the data in hand to take advantage of a lot of the things, right? So if you think about like a clinical visit, how much of that time is 
asking the same questions they've been asked by four other clinicians, right? Or if you think about, um, like I did work with uh, uh, genetic, uh, excuse me, genetic counselors, and they only are allowed by insurance two one-hour visits. And one of those hours is an entire speech that they give every time explaining human genetics. So if we can offload that to a game, an app, video beforehand, that means that that patient is going to get an extra hour of genetic counseling, which is hugely valuable. And then I think for bench scientists, especially, there's lots of stuff in AI and there's lots of stuff that should be about creating efficiencies and then also creating new insights. So one of the nice things about AI and machine learning is that it pours through all this stuff and comes up with a bunch of ideas and you're like, garbage, 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 garbage. Oh my God, I never would have thought of that. I wouldn't have seen that correlation, right? And that becomes a way of sort of extending you. So there's lots of new things we're doing tech with technology and healthcare, but ideally we can also increase um, uh, efficiency or like Ken likes to say joy. Like I think we've all got this, this dream that this stuff will be fun to use. That you'll look forward to using it as opposed to dreading it. Right. Um, and, and really, I think that's a shared dream that like Ken and others have inspired a lot of people too. Let's have, Vicki, share her expert thoughts on this. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Um, that is a really great question. And I think it's, you know, certainly an area of, of high importance right now with the, the burden and burnout of clinicians at the bedside. Um, I did a, a study, this, this goes back probably about eight or nine years now, that clinicians did not feel prepared to talk about apps with patients and families um, at the bedside and and could not answer their questions. And I don't think that has changed much. You know, in fact, I like to talk about it um, in terms of we've now moved to app fatigue with our clinicians when it used to be alert fatigue. And we're not really studying what that app fatigue is doing. Um, so there are a lot of efforts right now. Um, in fact, AHRQ um, has a, a huge effort underway to take a look at this. So I expect to see more research in this area. So if it's something that you're interested in, I think it's a perfect spot to focus on.